quick introduction. Uh, Joey Connect, uh, senior leader uh, with a company called Proteus. We're based out of the Lincoln, Omaha area. I've been with the firm 20 some odd years. So I look forward to sharing uh, today lots of things. Uh, but obviously, uh, this topic for, for today's webinar is, is the churn zone. And I'll expand into each of the areas, obviously, here a little bit. But I also will point out um, supplemental resources. We, we've obviously been in uh, this line of work for a long time. And and if this is your first webinar with with me, Joey, um, uh, speaking, uh, you'll you'll see kind of my technique and style is more gestalt or sharing experiences and challenges we see in the field, obviously that we've helped our customers solve, but then also just in general. And I typically share these in a framework where uh, there's no debate. You can actually uh, take these to task on your own and start improving. Uh, processes within your organizations uh, literally today. And so that's that's typically how I, I like to run these, um, uh, sharing of the value and the stuff that we've learned. Of course, we have an extensively proven platform called Engage that uh, addresses all three of these areas that we're going to be talking about today. And at your uh, grace and pleasure, you can look into that and, of course, align a time with us. But I really, just for clearing the deck, this is not a demo. If you want a demo, you can sign up for a demo. Uh, what these are typically is me uh, explaining and helping you bird dog problems, basically, uh, or areas of opportunity within your own organization. Um, I do kind of preface this presentation um, a little bit. Um, a lot of our clients are obviously in the in the B two B space, um, and so this is a little bit more centric, obviously, to B two B. This is also a little bit more correlated with more complex offerings, um, not $10 widgets or other, you know, kind of things. That's great. There's a lot of those companies, obviously, but a lot of our clients uh, and where a lot of the, the tools, tips and tricks and um, uh, value I'm going to provide you here today really, really resonates in um, kind of more complex environments of uh, products, services, software. We have clients in all verticals, but um, uh, really, it's around more complicated uh, experiences or high dollar value experiences um, where churn is different than maybe churn might be for if you're selling a um, $5 app online or some sort of low dollar. Uh, that's a different attack approach from churn. So to just help preface for anybody on today, make sure this is valuable to you. Not that they wouldn't be even if you are doing that, but a lot of the context of what I'm going to talk about here today really focuses around a little bit more complex environments, B2B, and uh, we'll, we'll kind of go through it. So I, again, appreciate everybody's time. I'll say it again, Joey Connect, one of the senior leaders uh, with the enterprise, um, and I look forward to walking through with you. So I'm going to, a couple of things for this. Obviously, churn is important for everybody, but churn is a lagging indicator. It's already happened. Um, and so what we're going to be looking at here today is kind of what we've uncovered with working with our hundreds of clients and thousands and thousands of onboardings um, and kind of aligning that for kind of key indicators to kind of look at. And I think you're going to be surprised maybe in some of the areas uh, that I address or, or bring up here um, because we have various, if you're wondering who your peer group is here, it's interesting uh, because our peer group ranges across a lot of functional areas within the enterprise. We have CROs on, we have chief customer officers on, we have VPs of sales, uh, we have customer success leaders, because uh, we really draw into a lot of different areas, implementation folks, lot, lots of different, because uh, today in business, it, it, it is a, a, a group effort, uh, no pun intended, uh, to, to make something uh, go well for a customer. So we're going to, we're going to kind of cover that here. So bear with me, I'm going to um, I, I go kind of fast. I'm native of New York, so I talk fast. Um, so, but it is recorded. I'll be sharing this out and I will probably refer to other webinars or other resources that we have where it's all documented and papered out. Of course, I'll share this video, uh, and also, uh, the deck. So if you, you don't have to take notes if, if you don't want to, uh, and I will talk nothing about the election in any way, shape or form. Um, and I hope, uh, uh, <laughs> and so, yeah, I'm just done with it. I think everybody is. Uh, so let's get started. So again, appreciate it. And we're going to jump right into it. Um, or so right out the gate, um, I'm right out the gate. Nothing happens. Have a, there we go. Um, so 
so some of these things are, are very interesting. And again, I'll, I'll restate this many a times uh, throughout the presentation, because clearly in a group webinar, um, there are different kinds of stakeholders, plus each one of you has a different kind of enterprise, right? And so people kind of get hung up on the word churn. So we look at churn, about 75% of customer churn happens kind of in these three critical areas. Of course, there are other areas and it varies per industry that you're in, but it's a, it's, it's a huge number and you can do the math for your own company. Um, and there's also the, the, the cousin, let's call it, or maybe even closer, blood brother, blood sister uh, of that, which is your one and doneers. Um, and so if you're in professional services, software, other service kind of companies, it's like a hidden churn, basically. You get a client, but they do one thing with you, and then they disappear when their um, LTV to you should be uh, way higher. If you're not familiar with the word, uh, the, the phrase LTV, that's lifetime value, LTV. Uh, there's some resources on the site that can help you break that down and how you figure that out. I talk about other things in here like CAC, customer acquisition course. We'll call we'll call that a little bit. We'll, we'll walk through that here in a little bit. But so there's like overt churn, right? Where you're like, hey, we got the client and you start onboarding them or whatever. And then all of a sudden, hey, we don't have the client anymore. Clearly churn, right? That's, that's a black and white kind of churn. Um, but then there's quite a bit of hidden churn, which is, again, what I just talked about. You're one and doneers. And then also for every client you churn, most of our clients will really, we push and try to help guide them to getting three to five referrals from each client also. Um, so the the math of that is a pretty substantial number, right? So it's just not the churn. It's also all that downstream stuff that you could have been getting from those clients. And especially the one and doneers, because that's tough. Um, and we'll talk about that a, a little bit here. So again, in your mind, you can kind of frame because sometimes people are like, we have like zero churn or very little churn or some sort of statement like that. I'm like, kudos. But how much growth are you having with each, with each client? Is the value of those clients going up? Could there be other things that you could be monetizing uh, to drive value there? So as we go through this, you can think overtly from your churn, clearly, but then also, do you have a lot of one and doneers? And, and maybe they're one and done for a couple of the reasons I'm about to share with you here. So I, I like to frame that a little bit because everything in business is math. And so as you start to figure out your math or you use some resources of ours to help you with the math, like the numbers start to add up pretty substantially, right? All right, so kind of the clear the deck, the risks and, and, and the impact. Before I jump into kind of, I'm gonna summarize the three areas and, and then I'm gonna back out a little bit, but the, the three hidden drivers of, of churn, um, and again, apply this to your organization accordingly, um, is a concept we call we call the last 25% of the sale. The second one clearly is the onboarding process. Uh, uh, we have many onboarding leaders with us, obviously. Uh, we do this a lot with clients. Uh, depending on the industry, uh, 15 to 25% of churn actually happens just straight up in the onboarding. Um, so if that doesn't scare you, uh, it should. Um, and it's really, really, and it's getting worse. Um, and we'll talk a few things about that. And then we really then get into the first 120 days. And I think the best way to summarize that, I'm going to go through each one of these a little bit here, just to help frame again, change the percentage to match your industry. You know, again, I'm talking in broad strokes here, but again, to every product or service is a little bit different. And then the first 120 days is, um, and you might say, no, it's really four months. Great. But what it is, it's a very short period post-launch that you have a chance to make it or break it. And I'll get into a, a more factors around that. So last 25% of the sale, you might say, Joe, what the hell is that? Um, some of you might say, oh, that's closing the deal. Yeah, yeah, great. But what happens in the last 25% of the sale, it's like map this to like a personal journey of yourself. So when I was dating my wife, or at that time, girlfriend, no problems. All of a sudden, you ask her to marry you, and all of a sudden, a whole lot of other people want to get involved planning the wedding, right? That went from a two-person deal to a 30-person deal in the span of a day. I always joke about that great family, just using it as a use case to help explain it. Same thing happens in, in sales, right? So sales, sales is going great, 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 great. Okay, we're getting serious. 
boom, we're going to we're going to do something. All of a sudden, 30 different, 50 different people, especially we work a lot in regulated industries, healthcare, financial services, others. Um, the number of people just explodes in, in those deals and the complexity starts to filter in. And there's a lot of needs and wants. And there's a lot of expectations and stakeholders. I'm going to break this down into more. And that creates a lot, a lot of problems. Um, and churn starts to begin at that point because of a lot of missed expectations and things that are just straight up missed. If you don't believe me, trust me, I'll walk you through a lot of these things because that's really where it starts in modern day sales now um, and B2B. Okay, so you get that. You got a ton of people there. You got a ton of hopes and dreams and this thing is going to transform everything. Our business is going to be great. This vendor is unbelievable, whatever it might be. This service is awesome. And then you got to get into the onboarding process. And there's kind of two critical demarcation lines, bifurcation, whatever you want to say, inside onboarding. You have the dreaded handoff process, which categorically for many clients is a really dangerous period for them, specifically depending on how long the sales cycle was, the dollar amount, complexity of the needs, et cetera. So you got a really risky handoff process. And I'm going to expand on that more of where a ton of churn just happens there. Um, and then you actually have the onboarding process, which again, if anybody on this call, and I know a lot of you are correlated with the actual onboarding process, what you have during onboarding is your company wants to race to hurry up and get the client live. And there's a lot of not agreeing to that in the process. And it's going to get really interesting and we'll unpack that more, but a tremendous amount of risk, AKA churn happens in the onboarding process. Okay. And then the last but not least, again, we like to call it the first 120 um, because this is you never get a second chance to make a first impression. Um, I, don't rem I don't remember what brand that was that did that. If you do know, put it in the comments. But ultimately, that's it. That's really the make or break, uh, especially in enterprise sales or any kind of uh, enterprise environment. You, you, that's it. After the first 120 days, you might as well. You could you could go through your customer list right now, and based on that, pretty much predict your 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 churn by the end of the year if you're doing annual contracts, or if you're doing monthly, you probably can correlate that to the burnout rate of your rev cycle. So, so thirty thousand foot complex B two B sales onboarding first one twenty how this correlates to churn, okay? That's where this all kind of comes in. So what I'm going to do, though, first, as we kind of penetrate each one of these, and I'll do a small presentation on each one of these segments to talk about the environment and kind of where the churn kind of derives out of that environment. So you can, first of all, um, plug that on your vessel. If you're taking on a little water there, maybe you can go address it right now and fix some things still in this quarter making 2.5 starting great for you. Um, and then maybe for some of you, there's a whole lot more that needs to be fixed. But what I'm trying to help here, and again, all of our webinars are framed like this, trying to take knowledge and information from our clients and convert that into actionable steps that you guys can do. Of course, we do all this in our platform, da-da-da. It's not a demo. Ultimately, want to give you some bird dog to think about that, whether that's under your purview or under another leader within your enterprise's purview, Okay. So hidden churn drivers. So let's step out for a second because it's not just about churn drivers, it's about the environment. And so in modern, obviously engagements, um, you have a tremendous amount of stakeholders involved and um, I'll date myself here. So I am 47 years old, young old, I don't feel old, 47 years young. And it was very much in the purview in my career that I could sell million dollar contracts and probably talk to less than five people and get that million dollar contract over the line, right? Now, on a contract, service offering, anything, we used to say 50,000. Now it's, I, I dare say it's around 10 grand based on the numbers that it is now a consensus environment meaning on the left-hand side is your new customer 
and on the right hand, I'm oh, sorry, on the left hand side is your team. And then on the right hand side is the customer you're onboarding, right? So during the sales process, it's getting blown up, tremendous amount of stakeholders involved, um, huge customer acquisitions costs, CAC. And that's important to know, customer acquisition costs, because it, it heavily correlates to the whopper of churn, um, where many clients, they're fully upside down. They haven't, they didn't just lose the client, they lost money on every deal. And I'll walk through that here in a second. So you got a ton of people on the left-hand side on your team, making the deal get over the line, then onboarded, and then obviously out. And on the client side, you have a plethora of people. I mean, I am not joking. We have clients that have 30 to 50 stakeholders on a deal um, that are actively involved in the deal. Um, and it's just, it's just consensus. And so you got a huge amount of players. And I think many of us remember the old telephone game when you were in elementary school or college or whatever, where you say something in somebody's ear and by the time it gets to the end, whatever, you're launching rockets, right? It's like so way off, right? Um, same thing happens here in all three of these phases, hence the risk. The sales process, missed expectations, the onboarding, not a clear expectation and visibility and accountability, same thing in the 120, right? And so by design, you have a people problem here. You have a tremendous amount of stakeholders that has just amplified the complexity. Complexity in our world equates to risk. Risk, obviously not handled correctly as churn, right? So you got an environmental issue. Again, map this to your environment. Your numbers might be a little bit different, but this is not only happening at a uh, everywhere, it is uh, increasingly happening in, in many, many industries. Again, definitely if you're working in any kind of regulated industry or selling in any regulated industry, the numbers are what I would call cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. They're they're big. So it's it's a big demand and a big lift, and a lot of problems can happen out of there. All right. So macro, you got a big, big amount of stakeholders and a and a two-way environment, right? The next piece is interoperability, which I just that's a fun, fancy word, but 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 I haven't said that in a while. That's why I threw it out there. But um what you have is a tremendous amount of communication, collaboration, and data has to move back and forth on all of these transactions. And it has to be done securely, and everybody has to have the right versions of it, and all sorts of things have to happen to execute the process. It's definitely during the sales process, the last 25, the onboarding process, of course, tremendous amount of visibility and accountability it needs to be mutual in that respect. Um, one of the things that our platform does really well is guiding these processes and what we call experiences through mutual plans, checklists, other things. But ultimately, you got a ton of stuff that has to be going on and it has to be visible to a whole lot of folks so that everybody's held accountable and on schedule. We'll talk about that here when I break down each one of the three phases here in a second. So ultimately, you got a lot of data and information that has to be going back and forth. And that has to be externally facing to your customer, not just inside your CRM or you know Salesforce or HubSpot or some internal system you have, a lot of this has to become available to your customers, which again, you got to bridge that gap um, and, and do all that. These are just must-haves. These aren't even like the problems. These are just pay to play. Like you better be doing this or that's a whole nother layer of challenges you're bringing on to all three of these phases that we're talking about here. All right. So you got macro pressures that are just ultimately there. All right, so now I'm going to drive into the first driver, um, which is the last 25% of the sale. Again, I'm going to start from the top on this. If you're late joining, what is the last 25% of the sale? Again, it's when you're starting to get into the actual environment there on the left. So most clients and most anything B2B, literally, is almost complex now just because the number of people. Right. So you got a complex sales environment. You're throwing a lot of CAC at that customer acquisition cost, meaning the cost of the sales reps, marketing, um, subject matter experts. Many of you have SMEs that are getting involved. Many of you have engineers getting involved. Um, all sorts of heavy duty resources um, involved in that sales process. Right. And you got a consensus decision-making environment, as I've repeated now a hundred times, because this is the, the 
the, the juggernaut of issues. Um, everybody's got an opinion and their opinion does matter and they can kill the product post sale or during the onboarding in a millisecond. Um, so you got all these stakeholder interests that you have to kind of appease to. A lot of times you have some sort of requirements from the customer also. You're bridging two environments and integrations. You guys can read. I'm not going to go through them all. But you understand kind of the environment, right? The last 25. So the churn drivers. So where does churn come from? Joe, you said all of this relates to churn. So let's get into it. So, so I am confident with pretty high pretty high, pretty high percentage here. Um, many of you know what a top-down or bottom-up sales strategy is. And so top-down is great. The sales team has done an awesome job convincing the C-suite that they have a problem. C-suite says, great, we want to buy your product, service, offering, whatever. But C-suite frequently doesn't really understand what the problem is and how it should be solved a lot of times. Or the reverse, you have a bottom-up, which is you're working with the people who are experiencing the problem every day, and then you're having to then convince the C-suite. So you, you say to yourself, Joe, well, how, how does that relate to churn? So every single one of you, I believe, has a CRM, Customer Relationship Management Tool, a.k.a. a Salesforce-like solution. Do you know Salesforce and all CRMs? You can Google fact check me all day long. 75% um, of those deployments fail whether they officially churn out or unofficially go dormant or you don't trust any of the data in it um, is about right around 75% historically over the last 15 to 20 years, right? So ultimately not providing the value that is desired. Why that is huge for churn is CRM is one thing, but all of your product offering services, you have to be very sensitive to how the deal came in. Did it come from a top down? Because that's where a ton of the failure ones come from, like the large percentage of it is from a top down sale in. Because what happens in the later stages, the next one of onboarding, there's an absolute mismatch of problem and solution. Um, so think about that in, in your world. Um, also, in the last 25% of the sale, sales reps do a really good job and consultants do a really good job of painting a picture of a problem to the C-suite. But ultimately, when it's being deployed, the C-suite doesn't do the deployment. The field team members and managers and, and the people who are going to be doing this every single day get involved. And the threat is, is if this is deployed correctly, they start to connect the dots that this is going to kill their job. This is very prevalent right now, as many of you might imagine, with AI-based solutions, right? Uh, and other solutions of operational efficiency and other things of that nature. It's a real danger thing where basically the sales process convinces optimization and all of this, but then ultimately the people who are deploying it kind of connect the dots. And I don't want to say they sabotage the opportunity, but there's a lot of um, non-optimal, let's say, environments there, which ultimately turn, turn the solution out. Okay. Something to be thinking about with your product, service, and offering, and who you're selling it to, and then who ultimately is deploying them. Um, a lot of companies, uh, and this might be yours, we see this all the time in organizations that they're lacking the number of SMEs. They have a SME issue, subject matter expert issue, and or engineering issue. So during the sales process, the clients aren't properly being basically analyzed of how much it's going to cost to deploy with them or how they would actually solve the problem. And so there's a tremendous amount of risk for churn in that area. We have tons of clients that have come to us that say we don't have enough SMEs um, and this is holding back the growth of the company and they need a better way to manage their closing sales process, the business case, and then ultimately um, the onboarding experience. So map that to your environment because if you're not leveraging enough SME activity and experts against that. The onboarding is going to go sideways and turn them out. Just fact. Um, next one, business case expectations. Um, again, this is misalignment, basically. Um, huge problem for organizations. Um, 
I'm not going to get, we could do a whole webinar on, on business case expectations and the misalignment of that, but ultimately making sure the business case that was sold in one is real, can be attainable. And then I'm going to show you how that needs to be then the bedrock of the onboarding experience because time to value for the organization and commitment of, of deploying your service, your product, whatever you're doing has to be really held accountable to that business case so that you guys can show the value of your service very, very quickly. Because again, you have a short period of time and commitment from the partner to, to make this happen. And that's where a ton of the onboarding deals die when you're onboarding somebody when it dies or they turn out is because they're not seeing the path to success quick enough or how it's going to provide them value. It was talked about in the sales and it sounded great, but the actuality of that and the commitment needed to get there frequently will not be committed and that jeopardizes everything in it. Sure. Okay. So you got to really align those. If your group isn't doing that, that's a simple, quick, relatively quick way to completely transform the handoff process, which we're going to get here in a second is basically based on those business cases. Um, the other one from a sales perspective is risk and phases. So going back to my young age, um, people used to buy everything in one lump sum. Um, and now your company is being forced to either Kia, Camry, Cadillac it, phase it, so certain things phased over time, uh, or you're just, if you're software, you're selling a module or something of like that, or a level of your service or whatever it might be. So now it's a double, double, triple, quadruple whammy for you because they're not even willing to commit to getting married. They just want to date longer. And now you have to, you've spent all this money and effort and energy and you better move fast to prove your value. And so that's a tremendous amount of risk for churn there. Um, and we're going to kind of unpack that a little bit more here in the second one, which is the the onboarding experience. All right. So you might be wondering, we're talking about churn and now Joey's talked about sales, but this is really just being very, very transparent. I, I'm not making this up. This is not us. This is what we see in reality as we convert clients to our model of connecting these into a seamless experience that a tremendous amount of money, A, is being left on the table during the sales process because of lack of definition and refinement on that. So it's not only just churn. In this case, you're you're losing rev, uh, misquoting it, uh, missetting expectations, et cetera. And this all is kind of the starting point into the next two phases. We like to call it gigo, garbage in, garbage out, right? But this really starts to affect it. And unfortunately, PUDs, onboarding teams, CS teams in a bad position because in some cases you're just doomed from the start, right? The chances of success are already 50%. So you got to be fair across how this touches multiple elements of the enterprise, okay? So I know we're talking about churn and I'm talking about sales, but literally in B2B sales environments, literally this is where it starts, okay? All right, next one. For the onboarder hats in the room, um, onboarding is, is tricky, um, very, very tricky. Um, and I love this part of the process because there are lots of things you can do to kind of optimize this for your organization. And there are some sketchy words that people don't like to use, like accountability and visibility and these types of things that we really push. But at the end of the day, it works. All right. So let's start again. Kind of from an onboarding perspective, this is kind of the environment many of you are dealing with. All right. Um, one is you again, limited SMEs in engineering. Um, you have a customer handoff process that I'll use the word wonky is what we hear a lot. I don't, I don't know if that's a real word, but wonky um, is not an official process. Um, and we have many clients that come to us. It's amazing, and this might reflect to some of you, is they are hell-bent on that the sales team never talks to an onboarding person or an implementation person. Um, it's, that's tough. 
especially in 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 B2B sales, there's there's quite a bit of relationship and domain knowledge that should be shared. I'll pu- I'll put the flag on the ground for anybody who's leading an onboarding team here. We see a lot of clients that are knocking it out of the park. Their onboarding team members are actually involved in the last 25% of the sale. So that the relationship is already being built. Those little things that you know you can't document and catch, they already know. Um, and it proves very, very successful in that handoff of that relationship. But I know many of you are saying, Joe, that's not how we operate. I get it. It's like a Ford Chevy conversation. Some group salespeople should just knock out deals and then move on so they can continue to hunt. The problem is, is if you start calculating your churn, they can hunt all day long. But if everything coming in the door, a large percentage of that is going out the door, you might know why, right? This could be the reason. Um, because the customer feels like they're starting all over again. I'm jumping to turn drivers, but so the handoff process, that alone is a whole process within your enterprise that you have to make sure is going well. And then that correlates, of course, to your onboarding processes and expectations, right? Setting those mutual expectations. I'm going to say something here on the customer commitment that you might not agree with here in a second. Of course, Management wants velocity, so you guys can launch as many clients as humanly possible, right? We're in the we're we're in business. Let's let's get them in, make them happy, and and continue the journey, right? Um, you need to collect a ton of data from the clients. On the left hand side, again, the environment. Everybody's dealing with these problems, and of course, there are ways to to handle those. Where those turn to the drivers of churn is customer commitment. Um, so we frequently ask new customers of ours. Um, you know, what is the commitment on the client side to get something live um, and say, whatever it's it on average takes two to three weeks, but then how many hours does it, what, how much data do you have? It's setting the right expectations. And so even ourselves just in full transparency, engage the, our company, when we're bringing on a new client to get them set up to use, engage our product, if they can't commit to a three to four week period with a certain amount of resources, depending on the client, we won't onboard them. We say, when would it be best to onboard you when you can commit to those? Now, I know that might be an extremely tough conversation for some of you to have with your leadership and others, but the reality is, is if the customer isn't committed and all in to that process at that point in time, they're either going to have a horrible onboarding experience and churn out no matter what, or it's going to cost you 4x the amount of money to get them in. And that's not going to be healthy for your group anyway, right? And so that commitment up front is very, very important that you understand in your onboarding process, what level of commitment of stakeholders downstream do you need in order to achieve it? Because what happens is, is companies go in blind to onboarding. Again, this is a whole new team, right? Like you probably have sold this to the C-suite or some other group. And now you're being obviously led towards the actual users of the platform. And you got to restate everything. Why are we even here? Who are you guys? What are we doing? And then even better, you now say, great, I have 58 homework assignments for you now. Let's get these out as fast, done as fast as possible because we want to start making money. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. Did any of you wake up today wishing you had 58 more items on your plate? I doubt it, right? And so there's a lot of upfront, why are we doing this? And this comes back again to the business case of we're here to help. Here's how we're going to help. Here's our mutual plan with you. We're going to be doing this. You're going to be doing this. And in a very short period of time, we're going to start to show you guys tremendous value. You're going to look like a rock star, right? Right. So think about those on your end from an onboarding perspective. This is less about bits and bytes. Of course, you got to do a lot of stuff there, but this is also about just priming and setting the right expectations and getting them to commit to that so that when you do start the onboarding for real, you can get to that time to value as fast as possible and it's set up correctly and you have the needs met and you have visibility as to the next steps and everything else that you need to be doing it. These are the devil in the details that are really the drivers of what you would anecdotally say, how did that rollout go? Or how did that onboarding go? You'd say good, 
or you'd say bad, right? Another just side trick around this, if you want to have some fun with your teams in a good way, not fun in a negative way, um, is do pre-mortems. Um, I say this on a lot of our webinars because um, it works. Um, so on every new client onboarding or last 25 or the next 120, whatever it is, after I, we particularly, I like to, our teams, just ask it to the client during the onboarding. If this were going to fail or take longer than expected, why and what would be that? And what that's trying to do is before we have problems, because everybody has problems, right? I mean, like, let's cut the crap here. Um, you're dealing with humans, you're dealing with business, you're dealing with technology, you're dealing with whatever. You're dealing with a lot of stuff, a lot, a lot of freaking moving pieces. And it's not that there aren't going to be problems, but being able to have a clear and transparent relationship and being able to work through those problems. So let's get those problems out on the table uh, a lot sooner during any of these processes. So weaving that in, that simple sentence um, can start to unearth 25 things like, oh, Bob, the manager, he's on vacation for six weeks. Hmm. That, that that could hurt our, our onboarding. That could hurt our time to value. That could hurt everything. Actually, that jeopardizes the entire onboarding. I think we might want to reschedule this onboarding, right? And so ultimately, pre-mortems are a nice, safe way because it's it's mutual. What I mean by that is you're asking the client. And then also your internal team. You don't have to ask your internal team, obviously, in front of the client. But you can say, Tiffany, Tommy, Frank, based on our first meeting and everything we see here, what red dot items? We call them red dot in our company. But what 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 kind of items do you see here that are, are a threat to the success of this? Okay, let's talk about this. Same thing on the client side, all right? So that's just a, a, a hidden tool that that is a real easy way to deploy that within your organization. And it takes no effort to do it. Um, again, on this one, the churn drivers is the ROI modeling and benefit. Uh, this, this is really, really important. I, I, I think a lot of times companies are, you know, buying services and stuff and yeah, there's a, there's an ROI model, but how's it going to help the people you're actually deploying it with? How's it make their life better? And how can you partner with them? Um, in order to make sure that the deployment is a success, whatever it is, services, products, well, I don't care. Like help them help you by asking them, how can we also add additional ROI elements or measurements to make this successful? And the reason why I bring this up is also we have seen some companies that when they're onboarding, they're, they're onboarding everything all at once, right? And so we encourage, if possible, with your product or service to do kind of what I like to call the SEAL Team 6 model. If you want to get used business terms, call it benchmarking. Whatever it is, is where you deploy your product or service in a more smaller uh, environment. And you can test and validate things really quick and fix some things that come up before you release to the greater group. Sometimes clients call those pilots. Pilots more of, are they deciding to go with you or not? So I try to stay away from pilots as much as possible. It's more benchmarking. So you can get a smaller group of people to move a lot faster to get, obviously, the value out there. Because ultimately, your clients don't have a lot of time, right? You're just another thing on their plate. So we got to get to showing them value as fast as humanly possible. As fast as humanly possible um, is really, really critical. Okay, so time to value there. All right. Onboarding, check them out. Think about them in your own world. Okay, the first 120 days, last but not least. Um, so we see a lot of clients here. So you, again, have worked through. Again, if you can do a pilot or a small launch, that would be great because you can then get to the first 120 very, very quickly. And then as that's going on, you start to then onboard the rest of the teams to that. So you're staging your deployments, but some things you need to be aware of in the first 20, uh, some group, some clients call them like tiger teams. You're probably familiar with that, but it's like an all hands on deck for whatever product or service you're offering. Make sure your teams are thinking about this too. And not just, we, we've seen some in some tech companies, we've seen some um, too quick to just move them to regular support. Um, so you've spent a year trying to sell into them. You do 
a, a one month onboarding, two month on whatever the onboarding period is, and then they go live. Too many clients are like, like shift them great. Now support owns them again. The classic siloing kind of ecosystem, which is not healthy. We really encourage a a, a tiger team type of model or some sort of uh, dedicated ish team to really carry that through for the first 120 days because there's too much domain knowledge, uh, other elements within there um, that you want to maintain so that you can be what is the turn drivers on the right hand side here. So did we meet the go to go to market expectation trainings and everything? Did we get the right momentum and visibility to problems? There are going to be glitches or bugs if your software, something's going to happen. You want to obviously hopefully have that happen to a smaller team and you better quickly, you know, get that fixed, right? Like this is where you can have problems, but the problems won't churn them out or this, you know, make them disappointed in the product or service. So you want, and you want that to be with the same relationships, right? Not with a whole nother new set of freaking support people that don't have any knowledge or background or any of this. So it's really critical that you allocate that kind of environment to this. This is, this is really, really, really critical. Why? Because again, you're getting your product solution services out in front of a whole broader group of people and they don't have the backstory for the last two years. So it's mission critical that they feel comfortable saying good things to you and bad things to you. And that's really how you have to look, be very candid with that so that you can get them across the line fixed really quick, real quick, and make them successful. Again, modeling out those ROI elements you've talked about, right? Whatever that business case has evolved to by this time, because you need to be going not only to them, but also their managers saying, see how quickly we're already having an impact for good. And again, I can't break down every single company, but I think you get the spirit of it. You have the sale, which you are overarching value. Then you have the onboarding, get them configured for success. And then the first 120 days, you got to have that refined and optimized so that they're seeing, and hopefully it's faster than 120. Hopefully it's in a week or two, depending on some clients. Um, you know, we have some clients that only launch 20 clients a year. Then we have clients that are launching 20 a day, you know, 90 a week. Like every client is a little bit different or product or service. So you got to kind of normalize this to your, to your cycles, obviously. But ultimately, you have to be able to start to prove that return on investment very, very quickly because many contracts nowadays are either annual contracts, some of them are quarterly contracts, right? You're fighting for your position, for your service, your product every single day because that company is still being called on by all your competitors too. So if you frustrated them at any point in this case, it's very easy for them to eject. Very few clients sign five-year, 10-year contracts, three-year, two-year, right? So you're always having to prove your value and you better prove it fast and you better prove it consistently from, from there on out because everybody is hunting for you and people change jobs, roles, whatever, like lots of things. There are all those other factors uh, related to long-term churn that are just still prevalent. But ultimately, we really try to help and look at how can we get whatever value you're pitching happening, basically, reality to that, because that will provide the momentum from leadership and momentum from the users to continue to progress down this path of additional modules being deployed or additional services being bought from you, right? You got to get quick, like show some value right out the gate. Too many groups want to elongate that and it just, the steam train loses momentum, okay? Just ultimately apply that to your group, okay? Those three areas obviously drive, uh, yeah, and some clients it's like 90% of their turn um, just because it's poorly executed and it's, um, siloed and it's the customer just flat out just gets frustrated and they're like, this is just a pain in the butt. It's not doing what we need it to do. And then you're out. Like that's how quick the conversation happens, right? It's, it, it's very easy to get rid of vendors or service providers nowadays. So you need to always be thinking that and overtly really addressing those three areas. And then there's still normal things, you know, 25, 30% of churn, which is ongoing things, uh, you know, changes in leadership, changes in the company. I mean, there's all sorts of things that obviously can still filter into to, to churning out. But if you're doing these three elements strongly and confirming the value consistently, because to me, churn is just value transfer. 
It's it's like beaver pelts and dollars. It's it's all the same, right? And so if you're still providing that value, it's going to be very hard for them to unseat you or get you out, right? So if I had to summarize kind of in a in a way that you can take this back, obviously all the things I just told you, pretty more all that kind of stuff are more tools in the toolbox for you to immediately look at your teams today. And I know many of you are shaking your heads and saying, yep, I see two or three things right away that we could probably address that could could help bird dog this. Because again, there's no magical place called happy to bill that everything is perfect. It's more we're agreeing mutually on things. We're executing against it and trying to find problems before they become problems, right? That's the whole point of process, execution, visibility, mutual, all of this is to be able to have that environment so that we both can get to value really, really fast. Um, so the number one I put is the the value to demonstrate, um, uh, the sorry, the ability to demonstrate value quickly. Like everything you're doing, try to figure out how you can make that become a reality that much faster without jeopardizing anything else because that is the number one driver. And that usually means obviously good communication, good collaboration, clear expectations, a very clear roadmap, commitment on both sides and executing against that and you'll get there, okay? Number one. The second pain um, is just the, the siloing, making sure you're herding the cats and setting the expectations on everybody because you need everybody to make this successful, um, to make this seamless, to make it timely. It's just setting the right expectations um, just across the board. Um, the next one, data is king. It always has been. It always will be, especially if you're selling some sort of technical solution or um, we have a lot of clients that are like manufacturing that sell hardware or assets plus software, right? Like all sorts of things, installations. We have a lot of clients that do installs too. If you're an install, this is like doubly amplified by having people going on prem and installing and making sure all your soup to nuts is 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 correct there. Um, because yeah, that that is wicked. Um, but data is king, of course, making sure all of this is being processed correctly. And the last one I put here is the mutual uh, engagement and process participation. Ultimately, it has to be a two-way relationship, not you demanding what should be done in all of these phases. Uh, I cannot stress the, 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 the changing of the relationship and the dynamic when you approach the problem, aka the purchase, the onboarding, or the launch in where you're proposing a clear roadmap of how we can get there, but then enrolling them to help guide you on what's the best route of doing that and the timing around that and all these kinds of things. So it's mutually owned. When you're pushing, it becomes your onboarding. When you're doing it or whatever, you know, launch, any of them. Um, when you're doing it in a mutual, clearly mapped out way that we really, really, really suggest you do because it works, and you can measure it and you have visibility on it and everything, you're going to have a higher batting rate across all three and dramatically affect the risk of, of churn there. Okay. I threw a lot at you. Obviously I always do. And I try to always share kind of use cases and, um, you know, different elements. Again, we see this across really all kind of de deployment types. Um, so I encourage you, hopefully you got a nugget of knowledge out of that that you can apply to your team. I always say this at the end of any of these conversations. And again, some of you have been on other webinars. Uh, some of you are new to engage. It's kind of, there's three paths from here kind of for you. Obviously you want a product demo, go ahead, sign up on our website. One of our great consultants will kind of walk you through uh, uh, the tool set. But I always, um, because we're, we're a conglomerate of many different products also. Um, so our thousands of customers is how we've learned and how we've become successful as we, we hear problems and then we provide ideas and solutions to that. So I offer up here um, just a brainstorm with myself um, to understand your environment and understand your problem or, or challenge you're working against. And it's, it's literally I'm there just to give you some ideas because obviously every company is different. And if that means somewhere in the horizon, there's an opportunity with Engage, sure. Um, but ultimately, I open that up. I, as I mentioned, I will include the demo. Oh, not demo. The sorry, not no demo. I will include the webinar, um, and I'll also include some very correlated resources 
um, on the sales side, obviously the, the alignment there, mutual plans and other things to help drive and make sure that sales business case is correct. On the onboarding side, obviously we have lots of different metrics and other things you need to be considering uh, around that ecosystem. And then same thing on, on the 120. So I'll share those resources with the, the packet with this. And again, I appreciate everybody's time on this election day, get out and vote. And again, appreciate it. And uh, I'll also include that. That's my email address there. I'll also include my personal calendar for that one-on-one -on -one brainstorm. So again, thanks and everybody have a great uh, voting day. Thank you.